Hello, everyone. My name is Helen Klebesaddle, and we are welcoming you to um, a, a session that is about uh, four different ways that artists are deploying art-based activist strategies to address environmental justice issues today. All right, I'm going to start by introducing our panelists. And first today we'll hear from Maddie Rose, excuse me, Maggie Rosicki Hiltner. Maggie is an artist and activist living in Red Lodge, Montana and the creator of Vantage Point. She serves as a Montana, Idaho regional representative for SACWA, the Studio Art Quilt Associates. Then we'll hear from Valeria Tatera. Valeria is a Wisconsin-based installation artist, activist, and lecturer whose work investigates the intersection of ethnicity, gender, commerce, and the environment. An enrolled member of the Bad River Band of Lake Superior Chippewa, Valeria explores self-identity, contemporary indigenous issues such as the impact of colonization on indigenous erasure, visibility, and resilience. Lastly, we'll hear from Helen Klebsaddle, the Emeritus Director of the UW Women and Gender Studies Consortium and co-facilitator of the Flowers Are Burning Art and Climate Justice Project with Mary Kane Newman. Helen panicked. Um, sorry. Um, so while Helen is, uh, Helen, did you share screen already? I'm about to. Okay, um, can I do a quick intro real quick for the- Please do. <laughs> um, so um, welcome everybody. My name is Stephanie Ritaletti. I'm the director of the UW System Gender and Women's Studies Consortium. And I just wanted to welcome everybody to our third session of the day um, in a three-day conference that we are running in a fully virtual format for the first time. Um, the theme for this year's conference is Resistance and Reimagination, Gender Change in the Arts. And um, this event is co-convened by the Women's and Gender Studies Consortium and UW-Madison's 4W initiative, Women and Wellbeing in Wisconsin in the World. And I'm really delighted to welcome this panel today for a couple reasons. Um, one, this was one of the original panels that was slated for last year when we had to cancel at the last minute due to the pandemic. And um, it was definitely one that was generating a tremendous amount of interest because it had so much overlap with the themes of our conference. So I'm really, really delighted to welcome all of, welcome all of these panelists back. Um, another um, reason that this is a really exceptional panel is we are also um, running a virtual artist exhibition that um, is archived throughout the entire conference and accessible. And many of the presenters today have pieces in there as well. Um, I'm also um, really delighted to welcome Helen Klebesaddle, who is the Emeritus director of the Gender and Women's Studies Consortium and led this conference um, through many, many years um, of its different iterations and is the reason that we're able to all gather here today because of her really amazing leadership. Um, so it's great to have Helen and all of the co-panelists here today. Um, I just wanted to say a few quick things about the conference in the virtual format. So we're running this in Zoom webinar. And what that means is um, as an audience member, you have the opportunity to directly ask us questions in the Q&A box. And we have saved time at the end um, for a moderated Q&A. Although we encourage you and we welcome you to ask questions throughout. Um, some of the panelists may respond um, by typing a response back to you immediately um, or we'll collate all the questions for the end and address them at that point. Um, if you're having any technical issues or have another question um, that you want addressed, um, you can send us a message through chat and we'll also respond that way. And um, Olivia, the assistant director for 4W and also the curator of the virtual artist exhibition um, has placed the link um, for the closed captioning service. We're working with Riverside Captioning for the entire conference. And you can click on that link and place it alongside your video um, if you would like to have captioning as part of um, the viewing experience for this panel. So I, um, again, just wanna welcome everybody and thank you so much for participating. Um, we've had really great interaction between audience and all of our sessions for the last two days. So again, I encourage you um, to interact with us and to ask questions as the panel proceeds. And now I'm going to hand it over to Helen to kick us off. Hi, well, again, welcome to deploying arts-based activist strategies to address environmental justice issues. We'll be sharing today four different uh, ways that artists are doing this work. And I'll pass it to Abby again for introductions again. Yes, I know folks are still jumping on. So I'm really excited to share all of our panelists here with us today. 
And first we will hear from Maggie Rosicki Hiltner. Maggie is an artist and activist living in Red Lodge, Montana and the creator of Vantage Point. She serves as a Montana, Idaho regional representative for SACWA, the Studio Art Quilt Associates. Next we'll hear from Valeria and Valeria is a Wisconsin based installation artist, activist and lecturer whose work investigates the intersection of ethnicity, gender, commerce and the environment. An enrolled member of the Bad River Band of Lake Superior Chippewa, Valeria explores self-identity and contemporary indigenous issues such as the impact of colonization on indigenous erasure, visibility, and resilience. And finally, we will hear from Helen Klebesaddle, Emeritus Director of the UW Women and Gender Studies Consortium and co-facilitator of the Flowers Are Burning Art and Climate Justice Project with Mary Kay Newman. there everybody. I'm gonna hide my face while we're talking. <laughs> oh wait, that's not that exciting. I'll keep it on. Hi, uh, I hope you've all had a chance to view the YouTube video of Vantage Point as part of the virtual art exhibition. Um, I wish you could have had the experience in person, but here goes. I run Red Lodge Art of Resistance, bringing socially engaged art projects to my small rural community, connecting us to national issues, motivating those projects. That's how I met Helen, doing her exquisite uterus project with my community. My personal studio practice results in a few bodies of work. Sometimes the stitched imagery is very small and intimate, using idealized Dick, Dick and Jane style characters to depict personal ideas and issues. And sometimes I use the skeleton as my protagonist. Anthracite odalisque that mirrors in size and design the French painter Hans 1814 painting the Grand Odalisque. Here you can see a bit of my process. This iconic painting is studied by just about every art and art history student. In Anthracite odalisque, you'll find little embroideries of America's many coal fired power plants. Coal creates one of the largest industrial waste streams generated in the US. Another body of work, uh -oh. another body of work is large scale environmental commentary. In 2015, I created Vantage Point for Mesa Contemporary Arts Museum. As an embroidery artist, filling 72 linear feet of wall space with hand stitched imagery would be my largest project to date. I began by designing an idealized landscape with a big blue sky, green grass, and puffy white clouds. Researching ways Researching ways of depicting cloud forms led me to thinking about clouds as water vapor and then water vapor as greenhouse gas. And other clouds, volcanic plumes, mushroom clouds. Oh, sure. Can you hear me a little better now? Let me know. Oh, let me see. Hold on. I'll reposition my mic. Well, maybe. Much better. And other clouds, volcanic plumes, mushroom clouds, emissions from factories, and puffs rising from cooling towers of nuclear reactors drew my attention as well. I grew up in the 10 mile evacuation radius of Limerick Generating Station, a nuclear power plant in Pottstown, Pennsylvania. The Limerick Towers could be seen from the windows of my middle school classroom. My friends and I swam in the bathtub warm water downstream from the power plant. Thinking about swimming in the Schuylkill River, once dubbed America's foulest river, led researching pollution in other waterways. For every case of devastating pollution, I found there was one worse, more extensive, more toxic, more insidious. Unseen pollution was prevalent, underwater, out to sea, microscopic. I had so much to consider. I researched issues specific to the venue. Arizona specific imagery featuring the border wall. Oh, could you go back one, please? Arizona specific imagery featuring the border wall, images of copper mines, and even unexplained phenomena in the skies above the state. Here's the work in progress in my studio. My interest in maps and perspective illustration drew me to include portal on lines and vanishing points, adding movement 
and linear design elements and poking fun at my tendency towards flat representation. Other image, this is another image of the design process. I included found imagery cut from countless tablecloths and handkerchiefs. What I don't find, I stitch out and add to the piece. Love Canal is an EPA Superfund site near Niagara Falls. It ended up leaking toxic waste into people's basements. Children of the era, the 70s and 80s, had told stories of playing with blue goo and pop rocks on the playground. You can see the falls and my beloved Limerick power plant. Like all my work, this piece leaves space for a bit of humor. It's not a polemic, it's the subversive stitch. Here are some depictions of rivers on fire. I also collaged mandalas to reference floating pollen and as an element to pull through the piece. These are the panels specific to Arizona with its border wall, both an environmental and humanitarian disaster. The panel on the left features lightning causing a brine tank fire at an oil rig, something that's happened more than once. A peek under the earth here shows a dinosaur dig. This panel is another peek under the earth, this time into a cartoonish version of hell. I included references to art history throughout the piece and even a tiny self-portrait. The left panel shows offshore drilling. The panel on the right features illicit drug production and its environmental and social ills. And the volcanic eruption in Iceland that closed the airspace over Europe for days in 2010. At the time of making the piece, there had been 2,048 nuclear bomb tests and two horrific uses in war since 1945 by the US and other countries. We are up to 2,056 now. Here's some more imagery related to war. Another peak under the ground for a mass grave and some characters on top acting out a metaphoric battle. Bombers and strange creatures are featured in the sky. My collection of stitched butterflies led me to want to highlight the butterfly mutations that were documented after the Fukushima Daiichi disaster. If you recall in 2011, an earthquake led to a tsunami that led to a meltdown. This seemingly idyllic farm references CAFOs, concentrated animal feeding operations, a factory farm with more than a thousand animal units. About 65 million, billion animals worldwide, chickens and cows and pigs, are crammed on the CAFOs. That's a lot of poop. Uh, the CDC's website says that it has a study on how the concentration of hog, hog production in North Carolina has a disproportionate negative impact on poor and non-white communities. I feature the ubiquitous cell tower. There are over 300,000 towers breaking up vistas across the US. Here you peek at Centralia, an underground coal seam fire burning near my grandma's house since 1962. It's not that rare. Unextinguishable coal fires are burning all over the world. I generated a list of terms of places and places picked up from headlines, news stories, and research. This stitched text became a news ticker above and below informing the scenes. A glossary book of the terms stitched out uh, on that news ticker is shown with vantage point in the gallery. So if a viewer is curious, they can look them up. The glossary is also on my website. The 276 square feet of hand-stitched imagery, collaged embroidery, evoke discussion of the value of women's domestic labor and the capacity of my artist's hand. Its size and content drive it out of the home and into the world of contemporary art and political discourse. It traveled to a variety of venues, changing shape to fit the spaces. Issues around the world are addressed, but the landscape is a bright but often dismal fantasy with no true geography. I usually travel with it to help install the piece and give an artist talk and sometimes teach an embroidery collage workshop. My goal in, con in connecting to viewers of the piece is to encourage discussion and contemplation and hopefully action on the environmental issues showcased in this work. I especially liked this installation as it wasn't in a traditional art space. It was in a space that thousands of commuters walk through every day. I had to have a viewer find the art rather than seek it out in an art institution was really powerful. In 2018, I began expanding the piece for an exhibition in Helena, my state capital. So back to the studio for more mandalas, back to the embroidery hoop for more text and imagery. I stitched an additional 39 linear feet to make the piece site specific for the Holter Art Museum. I made Montana specific panels. Here are some Yellowstone River oil spills from 2015 and 2011. 
These caused river closures and had a huge impact on our outdoor tourism industry as well as our ecosystem. Some panels that address our demand for cheap goods, leather tanning and the textiles industry produce insidious pollution and horrible conditions for workers. You saw my peaks under the ground, so here's a peek into space. The amount of space debris is mind boggling, accumulating since the first launch of an artificial satellite in, 19, in the 1950s. I stitched out wildfires and floods and industrial farms and hurricanes. As the piece travels, different imagery resonates with that locale. Visitors at a Florida venue that was devastated by Hurricane Michael in 2018 spent a lot of time with this panel. Vantage Point is now 425 square feet. That's 111 linear feet if you're counting. Plenty of room to feature pipelines and landfills, satellites and cyanobacteria, endangered species, cityscapes and wind turbines. Not everything depicted is necessarily bad, just things to consider all part of the conversation I hope to inspire. The world I made is still beautiful, but the impact of human consumption and waste is everywhere. These panels depict plastic waste, including the ubiquitous plastic bag. And here it is with little me in the middle at the Holter Art Museum. I lectured and taught workshops and the show was used for educational programming for hundreds of kids in our public school system. Thank you. Uju, hello, I'm hailing from uh, Milwaukee, and I would like to take this time to acknowledge the indigenous ancestors that inhabit the gathering place, the Ho-Chunk, the Fox and Sacks, the Menominee, the Maskutin, Potawatomi, Ojibwe, and the Mound Builders. I would also like to acknowledge the tribal nations that are caretakers of what is now Wisconsin, the Ho-Chunk, the Ojibwe, the Potawatomi, Menominee, Oneida, Mohican, and Brother Town and also other relatives that call this territory Wisconsin home. Buju, hello. Chimigwich, thank you for making the space to share my story about Enbridge Pipeline 5 and how the commodification of indigenous land and resources leads to the commodification of indigenous peoples. The Nibi or water images are by Joe Bates and show my ancestral home, Medicine River Reservation, or what settlers call Bad River Reservation. The idea to utilize art for messaging about Trans Canada's Enbridge Pipeline 5 started with a letter addressed to me requesting that I allow renewal access and easement to the pipeline on my family's allotment for $100. Next. Good to the Last Drop series is my protest and education campaign against Trans Canada's Enbridge Pipeline 5. Good to the Last Drop Water is the first artwork in my continuing series about the pipeline. Each specimen jar contains water from the largest of the Great Lakes in North America, Lake Superior, which is also the largest freshwater lake by surface area. Part of the Lake Superior shore is on my reservation. Next. The yellow orange shows my reservation. During the initial Keystone Pipeline fight in the Dakotas, in Wisconsin, the Bad River Band of Lake Superior Chippewas decided to deny easement to Enbridge Pipeline 5. Furthermore, it called for the decommissioning and removal of the pipeline from all Bad River lands and watersheds. The pipeline was built in the 50s, runs across my tribal land and under Lake Superior unprotected. Permission was given to this pipeline for a 55 year lease. The lease finally came up for renewal due to environmental concerns. The tribe denied easement. Next. Good to last drop resist pipeline five. I chose to use the black mourning ribbons of the Victorian era, which coincided with the forcible removal of indigenous peoples from their land to the reservation system. There are 75 black ribbons stamped with the word resist. The jars hold elements from my reservation. Two jars hold water, one from Lake Superior and the other from Medicine River. Both are important water resources on my reservation. The middle jar holds red clay from the reservation. 
The significance of the elements chosen are resources that are currently endangered. These elements provide sustenance, commerce, medicine, and cultural teachings. This piece is about holding onto tribal sovereignty and fighting to be stewards of our own land. Line five transports up to 540,000 barrels per day of light crude oil. The current line is in severe disrepair. As of March, 2021, line five is still in use illegally. Enbridge is ignoring tribal sovereignty and our right to safe water supply. We are currently in litigation. Next. Good to the last drop way of sorrows is made up of 15 black ribbons stamped with the word resist. Once again, the ribbons are referencing morning ribbons. There are 15 test tubes sewn down that slowly go from water to a combination of water and oil, and then to blood ending with a single drop. The water represents life, oil represents commerce, and blood represents my ancestors. This piece is about the exploitation of TransCanada's Enbridge pipeline towards our environment and my people's way of life. Only tribal nations should have the right to decide if pipelines run through their land. Nibe or water is the essence of life. It is the interconnection to the universe. I believe if we disconnect from our environment by choosing commerce over life, we will destroy this connection. Ambridge Pipeline 5 will impact the next seven generations. If we as, as an indigenous people do nothing, we will cease to exist. Next. Good to the last drop blood is made up of blood vials filled with ink. The ink represents promises of treaties. The texts on the vials are stamped good to the last drop. This piece is about historical events that led to the decimation of indigenous people to gain resources. It starts with the impact of genocide that led to the expansion westward or land grab called manifest destiny. The pervasive influence of racism towards indigenous people led to the legacy of injustices and broken treaties to garner access to indigenous lands and resources. The US government and corporate greed led to the reinterpretations of our treaties for their benefit. I feel that the US government and corporations would like us as indigenous people not to exist. But we have a saying, our existence is our resistance. Next. So when commodification of exploitation of indigenous lands occur, it is easier to exploit and commodify indigenous people. MMIWG2S stands for Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women, Girls, and Two Spirits. It is both a crisis and a movement. I became an activist after attending a Her Wellness Conference where I learned that through community activism that we as indigenous people can heal our communities. This shows the process of making abstract squash blossoms for two installations that address the MMIWG2S crisis. Squash is one of the three sisters who provides protection and is a symbol of cultural belonging. It represents the idea that those who have suffered immensely might help bear the fruits of justice. When I'm forming each squash blossom, I am present in the moment, thinking about the missing. Next. Sisters is made up of 500 squash blossoms. It is a physical manifestation of data that often erases indigenous individuals. Each squash blossom created honors and holds space for the missing. The project ultimately is to make thousands of squash blossoms, one for each MMIWG2S. It is a journey with an undetermined end. The studies have shown there is a connection between extractive industries and violence against indigenous women, girls, and two spirits. There are approximately 5,700 MMIWG2S. As data is collected, the number will increase. The US Department of Justice found that American Indian women face murder rates that are more than 10 times the national average. 
It wasn't until 2015, the Violence Against Women's Act was reinstated to finally include Native American women. It is the first time that they can prosecute non-Native men for rape. Next. And processed addresses how the judicial system erases MMIWG2S identities and memorializes the crime. These women, girls and two spirits held important roles in their communities. They made decisions. They held spots on tribal council. They worked to revitalize their language. They carried cultural knowledge and memory. They were mothers, grandmothers, aunts, sisters, and cousins. Next. Justice. Justice is not a quiet piece. It is a critical mass of ribbons. Each is stamped with the word justice, and each one represents one of the missing. The color red has significance. It is the official color of MMIWG2S movement and it is the color our ancestors see. When I cut and stamp the ribbon, I am present, putting my energy and good thoughts into each ribbon. My goal is to have one ribbon for each MMIWG2S. As new data becomes available, the art piece will grow, creating a living installation. Next. It is essential that we understand missing and murdered indigenous women, girls, and two spirits is not a singular crisis, but part of a broader settler colonial project that seeks to undermine indigenous sovereignty, erase indigenous cultures and history. Chimegwich, thank you very much. This is just to show a scale. Hi everyone. I'm Abby again, and I'm going to be talking today about the Tar Sands Storytelling Project. And this is a project that launched in the spring of 2019, uh, a first of its kind visual arts exhibition on this topic, uh, and was co-sponsored by three organizations, the Wisconsin Chapter of the Sierra Club, the Clark County Cultural Arts Center out of Central Wisconsin, Nielsville, Wisconsin, and the uh, Wisconsin Youth Network. So again, this project is a first of its kind collaborative, very grassroots uh, visual storytelling exhibit. It is comprised of 10 two foot by four foot panels um, that were completed by 10 different artists of different backgrounds from across the state of Wisconsin. And I wanna stay, say first right away that none of the work and education that was uh, possible in this project would have happened without the enormously generous donation of time, talent, and resources by artists and organizers on this project. So why tar sands? Um, we've heard a little bit about tar sands. Um, I will elaborate by saying that we have the world's largest tar sands oil pipeline outside of Russia here in Wisconsin. It runs from Superior, Wisconsin down to Flanagan, Illinois, and it pumps 1.2 million barrels of oil through the heart of our state every day. Uh, at the time that this project came together, there was a conversation around a possible twin line, line 66, that would parallel line 61 to pump even more uh, oil through Wisconsin. Um, we do not have a twin line at this time, but there are contingent fights, this fight against line five, as well as line three in Minnesota, um, that will affect whether or not we have even more oil running through Wisconsin. Tar sands oil is a really, really dirty fossil fuel. It's the most carbon intensive, um, most energy intensive fossil fuel. It takes 22% more energy to reduce tar sands to a petroleum product that is usable um, in comparison to crude oil. Uh, it's got this really gritty peanut butter like consistency that makes it really difficult to push through pipelines. And so there are additives that are essentially paint thinners to move it along the lines. The construction of the lines and the tar sands itself um, are an enormous threat to the land, water, and air around us, as well as indigenous culture, uh, treaty rights, private property, and as we are in this time of climate crisis, are inhibiting us from entering, um, from a transitioning to a just uh, and sustainable future. So I really hope that you'll take the opportunity to learn more specifics about tar sands through the project itself and the artwork. Uh, moving forward, I'm going to speak a little more to the logistics of the project, the intention of the work, 
Um, but again, hope you will take some time with the artwork and the online exhibition. So Tarsans was a really intentional collaborative and storytelling effort. Uh, there's a lot of information and a lot of intersections in this work that we wanted to present to folks as their own story and a way for folks to identify with this issue as the story of people uh, and less so a story of process or um, of this abstract oil called tar sands. Um, it is so uh, prevalent in our state as mentioned these multiple fights that are happening uh, and we really wanted to get the word out and we felt like storytelling was an effective way to do so. Storytelling has a strong tradition in social justice and movement spaces and is really effective to moving people to change. And the beauty of this artwork and the strength of it came from all of these artists coming together, bringing their individual talents, uh, preferences for style and approach that um, created this wonderful exhibition that drew out people's curiosity. It was fantastic as we have shared this exhibit across the Great Lakes region um, to see people come in and drawn in perhaps to individual pieces or just the diversity of the exhibition as a whole um, and then finding how they relate to each other and, and shaping this broad story that folks again could find themselves within. Um, so we were really excited about how it came together. Um, many lessons learned on this project but I want to speak to a handful here. Uh, first of all, this was again a collaboration between a few different organizations, artists and organizers and there's a lot of questions about how we have these conversations about something like tar sands that were being seen as perhaps political in certain spaces and how we navigated that. And again, being really intentional about telling a story uh, and not selling a stance. So coming at this from an art standpoint, visual arts in particular, um, we were really able to open doors quite literally into community centers, uh, campuses, uh, in true Wisconsin fashion breweries and uh, outdoor event spaces across the region to share this exhibit. It also opened doors in terms of the dialogues we were able to have the strength. One of the many strengths of this project was the way the artwork drew people in and made this topic very accessible to folks who may not attend other kinds of events or uh, conversations around this topic. Uh, we saw people really willing to engage in the artwork even if they weren't willing to engage in um, those of us who came along with it on these tours. So that was really exciting. Um, we felt it was also important to get the word out as soon as we could and to the communities along the pipeline. The original tour of this project started up in Hayward, Wisconsin at the Lakota Ray Ojibwa College and traveled down to Milwaukee. Uh, we reached over 800 people in that time uh, and the momentum of that work and that tour led us to continual showings until the advent of COVID-19. But at that point, we had reached over 2,000 folks, well over 2,000 folks in the Great Lake regions for this project. Um, Helen, if you don't mind going back just for a second. Thank you. Um, so it was really exciting to get it out to campuses and to take the work to the communities instead of waiting perhaps for folks to come find the information or come find the art in other settings. Um, so we're really successful in that. Lots of challenges in going about it that way, but um, lots of successes in, in meeting new people and having fresh conversation with folks along the way. Uh, I will just add briefly too that the organizers and artists on the call, I think there was a broad exchange of interests, ideas and understanding um, about tar sands itself. And also many folks who were part of this work that do not have uh, a background in the arts and really gain this deep appreciation for uh, the way the artwork carried the story and information um, and again was really accessible to so many new communities. And lastly, that visual arts matter and storytelling matters and this um, union on all, of all of these ideas was really effective. Again, we reached well over 2000 people before we had to stop, um, but are continuing to share this story in online spaces such as, as these. So we have lots of successes that we're excited about in this work, but there were many challenges in even before the project came to be during the project um, and questions we're still holding um, as it continues and as we kind of look ahead to um, potential next projects. And one of those is um, the challenge and the prevalence of unfair compensation for folks in the art world, not being compensated properly for time and labor. 
Uh, and this is also prevalent in nonprofit spaces and movement spaces where burnout culture is very real and folks are overworked for their time and, and for putting efforts into these kind of discussions uh, and this kind of work. And this is certainly um, was certainly a, an issue for us in this project and something we hope to do better on moving, moving forward. So I wanna share that in the spirit of transparency. Uh, likewise, this project came together again with those three organizations who leveraged our contacts and networks and folks we had worked with on this topic um, and folks in our lives, artists in our lives to bring this together. Um, but there are so many ways that we can reach out and have more voices part of this work and is something we think about as we uh, use this project as a stepping stone to other work hopefully in the future. And I think those two points and many other challenges can be bundled into this question of how do the structures, organizational methods and funding resources uh, reinforce the very issues that we're fighting? How can we better integrate the messages that we are sharing in this artwork or in our outcomes? How can we better integrate that into the practice of our work and how we're relating to each other in the process um, and how the project is set up? And so I will end with a little more information and some shameless plugs. You can see this exhibition uh, here and now at the consortium uh, conference. And I hope again, you'll take some time to really dive into the excellent work. Um, they are actually videos that you can experience and the overlaying narrative was done by artists and activists on the project. Uh, so I hope you can take some time to check that out. If you're curious about learning more about tar sands, the history of this project, and um, hopefully some future projects, um, you can check out the website that's tarsandstorytellingproject.wordpress.com. Uh, and as I've indicated throughout this presentation, there is hope and momentum to couple together the many lessons we've learned and um, suggestions that co have come along the way in this work into um, a future collaborative storytelling project. So if you are at all curious about what, um, what comes next, feel free to reach out. My contact information is there. Thank you, I will pass it back to Helen. Um, welcome everybody again. Uh, we're going to hold questions till the end. So don't don't worry if we don't answer your question right away. It's coming. We're going to try and save enough time so you can get all your questions answered. Um, again, I'm Helen Klebesaddle and I'm here today. I'm going to present on my project within a project, a virtual exhibition of The Flowers Are Burning, an art and climate justice project that I've created with uh, sister artist Mary Kay Newman, and uh, specifically our most recent version of it, which is The Flowers Are Burning, Oceans Arising. Um, we launched The Flowers Are Burning project in 2015. Um, it's, it's an exhibition that uh, where we use our art um, as two artists who uh, identify as feminist and as uh, watercolor artists who love uh, watercolor artists, but also who share concerns about uh, the, the um, devastating consequences of our current climate change uh, situation. And we, um, we take the position that um, everybody can't do everything, but if you start with what you can do and what you do best and try and use it to work on what you care about, then uh, that's better than, uh, than the alternative, which is often doing nothing. And because climate change is uh, such a huge overwhelming issue that has creeped up on us kind of slowly, um, it's been hard for us to face it and often we find ourselves in denial. So we've decided to try and use our art as a way to break through that denial and um, use the beauty of art to make it possible to focus on the issues. So we've been ex exhibiting this work since, I, as I mentioned, 2015 in a variety of venues, uh, mostly around the state of Wisconsin. Um, and the overarching um, questions that guide the exhibition are listed here on the screen right now. Um, we're kind of taking a position of something that's called biophilia, and it's the love of life and the love of nature. 
And given that 90% of our time as uh, Americans, uh, we spend indoors, we've kind of started to divorce ourselves from nature and we need to uh, reconnect and uh, remember how much we love it and um, understanding that if we love it, we will try and save it. So uh, our goal, our, and artists, one of the best things artists can do is uh, use our um, permission to stop, slow down and look, to share what we see and to invite, uh, invite others back into nature. And also to remind ourselves that we are actually nature and what we do to the earth's body, we do to ourselves and what we do to ourselves, we do to the earth. Now, so um, each, this is Mary Kay and I with, um, with some of our paintings from the first round of exhibition. The one in the center that we're holding so proudly is um, a, a piece on our Tide Pool series, which is uh, collaboratively painted. Um, if you're an artist out there, you know that um, probably one of the most difficult things you can do in the world is collaborate. But we decided that um, we were going to not only share our own individual artworks, but collaborate on paintings that we painted together. Um, and the shared belief that if we could figure out how to do it as artists, perhaps the rest of the world can figure out how to uh, collaborate and make sure that everybody's at the table that's uh, influenced by the decisions that are being made. Um, our, in 2020, we had intended to do a new physical exhibition of our most recent iteration of the project. And it's the flowers are burning, oceans arising. We were prepared to do uh, this new body of work, which is 90% collaboratively painted uh, for uh, Earth Day anniversary, uh, 50th anniversary uh, last, last, uh, last April for the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. But as you know, COVID happened and everything closed down and we canceled everything we were doing. Um, but we decided to turn this into a, um, uh, a virtual exhibition and we're able to, we just put it on our website uh, along with our other exhibition and you can go there and see all of the paintings. But this work focuses primarily on the effects of climate change on our ocean. We, uh, oceans, we, um, uh, we are guided by the science, climate science and are, have been in communication with a number of scientists who um, share with us the belief that this message has to get out and that our decisions need to be made by climate science. But um, the reality is that most people are not engaged with climate science. And so we've been encouraged to share science through our, um, through our art. So what we do is we create uh, exhibition, uh, exhibitions of works that we love and alongside when it's a physical exhibition, we have uh, pretty elaborate panels that talk about the issues around the, uh, whatever the issue is that's being addressed in the painting. Uh, I'll also mention that the exhibitions themselves are only half of the project. We, the Flowers Are Burning website, we have been collecting uh, information about other artists addressing these issues, but also um, um, access to the different organizations, kind of a, if you don't know where to go and you go there and you know what you love and you wanna work on, you can probably find links to the organizations that are doing most of the work on those issues. And we also uh, talk a little bit about um, how different areas are affected by it. We, we talk about birds, we talk about bees, we talk about the ocean, and we talk about the human species. Um, so we invite you to both go and visit our website, but also to um, share with us anything you think should be on the website that's not there. Uh, we do our best to keep up uh, with it um, as we continue our painting. Uh, as I, I mentioned, uh, we paint these collaborative paintings both by sharing the work back and forth in our various studios, which is what we've had to do during the pandemic. But we also sometimes um, gather and paint and talk about the issues that we're um, interested in, both um, how we um, 
you know, if you decide to face these issues, I'm sure every single panelist here will agree, there's a certain amount of emotional work you have to do in order to be able to be strong enough to do it. And so uh, we have the benefit of having each other to help us through this, uh, this work. And I am especially, it doesn't hurt, hurt at all that um, Mary Kay is a professional trauma therapist. <laughs> so she understands the, um, how we process this kind of information too, just how we deal with trauma in our lives. And so this uh, is very much a connection to our work to try and help people um, not just heal, heal but self heal and figure out how to move through our denial to take action. And we've, uh, our basic dis, uh, position really is um, you can do something and to do something will actually make you feel better. <laughs> so decide what you love most and work on that and work on it with whatever tools you have and find the other people that are working on it and work with them so you're not doing it alone. So uh, each of us learns a lot as we do the research for this. Um, and, it's, and we find other people who are working on uh, the same issues in their own ways. Um, take the time to read this quote here by uh, Professor Begley from uh, Lexington, Kentucky about what actually are the kinds of skills we need to address uh, these issues. Um, and it's not um, holding up with guns. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, the, uh, we, we are delighted to be able to try and do this work. When we, ex when we do exhibit the work physically, we not only have the labels of the um, issues that are being addressed, but we also provide an area where people can sit and process and write about their own concerns and think about what they want to do as part of the interaction. And we have found that it's not unusual for um, people to um, really spend a lot of time in the show and uh, take the time to think about it and to think about their own place in the process. As I uh, mentioned, we, Mary Kay and I are individual artists that do our own work. This is a painting by Mary Kay by herself. Um, and I do my own work. To, I'll show you a few of those at the end. But we've found that our collaborative artist is something unique and separate from either one of us yet in, contained in itself. And we are uh, really excited about the fact that it, uh, we together we create artworks that neither one of us could ever do alone. And uh, so that idea that when you bring more people to the table, you bring more efforts to the table, that something new and unique is created by the combination of those powers. Not unlike what's happening today on this panel, um, it, it's stronger and we're better for it. And we bring more intelligence and more knowledge to the table. So um, these are, I'll show you my last two paintings here. Um, you'll see that most of the paintings I've been showing you have been these bright, 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 beautiful coral paintings. Uh, we've noticed that uh, diseases are running through coral and starfish that are not unlike the devastating disease and viruses that have been affecting uh, humans most recently. Everything that's happening to us is happening to species in the ocean. So when we address um, our own issues, it, it behooves us to address those that are happening in the ocean too, because those are our own issues too. Um, so coral screams brightly when it's under stress, and then it uh, then it goes white. It leaches out, and it becomes silent because the uh, all the species that live within it um, can't, aren't there. There's nothing to eat anymore. So um, it's only when uh, the ecosystem starts becoming uh, healthy again that the species come back and you can hear the sound of fish munching on the coral and you, um, that silence goes away. So you don't, you, there are so many ways to judge how to uh, have a healthy ecosystem. Uh, and um, uh, so I invite you to come to our website, um, The Flowers Are Burning both for the oceans arising and all the other information there. And again, please, please, please feel very comfortable giving us any critique you want and adding any materials you think we should, including other artists 
who uh, are presenting. And believe me, every, if everybody is not already on the, the pan, uh, website that's presenting today, they soon will be. <laughs> so I, I'm going to stop here and uh, turn it over to uh, for our uh, quick Q&A. Great. Well, thank you to all of our panelists for sharing all of your work and for sharing your insights on your process and the communal networks that you've built um, throughout this and um, all of the different elements that go into considering how to put an exhibit out into the community, um, how to make sure that it's being engaged with in multiple communities and um, the different themes that you engage through your work. So um, I appreciated all of that. Um, we had a few just kind of logistical questions come in. Um, Olivia has been um, putting the link to our virtual art exhibition, which she curated and did a lovely job doing um, into the, um, the chat. And um, anybody can access that. So you can go in there and you can see a lot of these pieces. You can see pieces from other artists and there's a place where you can get, engage um, and ask questions through a forum at the bottom. Um, so we encourage you to do that and um, that will be open through next week um, for anybody to do so. So one of the, the first questions that came in for the panelists is um, when you're creating pieces like this and you're creating exhibitions that either that have some type of political message, um, how are you engaging key stakeholders in the community to ignite social change? So either people that we think of traditionally as um, change makers because they have access to power or communities that have traditionally or have the potential to mobilize to create social change. I'll just mention that um, uh, one of the ways that uh, Mary Kay and I have done is we start, we actually kind of consider the scientists, our community in some way, and we consider ourselves translators. So we often go, uh, uh, we interact with some of the people that when we're researching the issues and ask, what do you most want to be gotten out there in the world? What do you most want people to see and know? And then we, um, and we use our exhibitions and our websites. And then we, you know, we're in the rest of the world too. We join organizations, and we contribute to causes. And, and so there's, um, you know, I, I, I could start naming them, but 350 <laughs> and other ones like that. I mean, we work through, we don't think we can just reinvent everything. We try and work with the people that are already underway. And direct others toward them. The aspect that I find valuable is the education aspect. When my work travels, I travel with it and give a talk kind of like this and back up. You know, my catalog has a glossary and then it also has all of the, the bibliography of all my research. So to connect the art back to the facts is pretty important to me. And I really try hard to have the museums they, I work with their education department and I wanna start from the kids up. You know, if the kids go, then they tell, talk to their parents and bring them back and then parents get I guess for me, um, it's just bringing visibility to the indigenous people. We are not, you know, one monolithic culture. And um, I just feel it's important that when I do my exhibitions, I also include talks and lectures as well as workshops. Um, and that's the way I get to go out there and educate. Um, I use my privilege of proximity to whiteness to um, bring up these issues that maybe um, other people do not have access to. Also, I work very closely with Her Wellness um, Institute in Milwaukee, and um, we deal a lot with missing and murdered Indigenous women, girls, and two spirits. And so, um, as well as engaging with my own community, and I think that's what's important. I would just jump in and um, and and emphasize again what's already been said about education and uh, visibility. And I also, when I think about stakeholders, I think of all of us when it comes to climate justice and this effort of relationship building in the work we do, especially coming from an organ organizing effort that um, we want to reach everyone. We want to build relationships and communities um, wherever we can. And, and so being mindful of who we're not in relationship with or um, where else we can strengthen ties as, as part of this work. 
Great. So that leads me to another question um, that talks about the spaces where these different pieces have been. So Abby, when you started out, you 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 mentioned that your the Tar Sands um, project started in Hayward, Wisconsin. And Helen, I know you. I've heard you talk a, a lot about the different art spaces in northern Wisconsin before. And I was wondering um, if you could just kind of reflect on access to art in different spaces. Um, Maggie is not from Wisconsin, but I know your exhibit has traveled in different places too. And the difference between ad access to art in indigenous spaces and rural spaces ver versus more urban areas where there's more concentrated centers where people expect to see art and kind of how that plays out. I'm trying not to go first. So somebody go else, go. <laughs> I can go first. It will be messy. It's not a fully formulated thought. There's lots of lots of feelings and I want to add not only where some of the locations we, we were in um, rural, but that um, the Clark County Cultural Arts Center um, obviously is in Clark County and it's one of the poorest counties in the state of Wisconsin. So this org in and of itself to be existing and to be building community through the arts is a really wonderful thing and was fantastic that they played such a prominent role in this project. Um, and that has rippled out the project itself but also their work to um, even outside of that county in Wisconsin. So um, reflecting on where it's where our work has been uh and the meaning there and the accessibility i think again this was mindful on our part to bring the work where we wanted it to be and to in these communities um lots of rural communities but came through madison and milwaukee as well uh, and that was that was our effort to say that this isn't everywhere not everywhere has a gallery not everywhere has um has not everyone has time um, to go into these spaces. So we were catching students in between classes. We were catching community members at local meetings that they were already attending. Um, so trying to meet people where they are with this artwork um, instead of, as you say, um, you know, depending on their resources or privilege to make it to spaces that are traditionally um, where art is found. I'd just like to mention having sat in on some of the discussions that take place around tar sand that uh, I was really amazed at the um, pe people coming in who have had uh, the experience of having leaks on their land, who could talk from their firsthand knowledge, how the fact that uh, this existed and existed in places that people weren't intimidated to go into uh, drew in people with much greater knowledge than you might have found in the white cube of the gallery. Um, really, really powerful. However, I put mine in the white cube of the gallery. <laughs> I mean, we use that space too, and that's an important space too. But I have to say that um, being forced by the pandemic to go online actually um, meant, has meant that we have had a much larger audience for our work and have um, been able to also uh, use social media and uh, text-based uh, media in order to help get the message out. So in some ways um, having to, you know, physical is always wonderful, but having had to broaden that space has helped us get a much larger audience. I think for me, it depends who my audience is. Um, I like to go into spaces that are not necessarily indigenous and indigenous, you know, and bring that voice into those spaces. When I'm when I'm working with the missing and murdered indigenous women, girls, and two spirits, I include um, my community. In fact, they also um, help me make my squash blossoms. So it's kind of a give take and a healing. And I think that's really important where um, if I work within my community, it's more about healing rather than sending a message because we already know what, what is going on in our own communities. But to go into other spaces that aren't necessarily indigenous and just to be able to, um, I make sure that all my artwork has stories that go with them so they understand what each piece is about. Would you mention your current exhibition? This would be a Val Valeria. Um, it's Vulnerable Bodies and it is through the Waters Gallery space, but it is at, I'm not sure, Garv is it Garvner? Garver. Garver 
Mill, I'm sorry, I'm not from Madison. So <laughs> the work traveled there recently and that opens up April 22nd is when we have a virtual opening. I had two thoughts that I wanted to throw out there. And one was in response to the question, I really like optimizing the systems that are already set up with arts institutions, like their connections to public schools. And of course, the credibility that comes along with that institution supporting the art, you know, kind of the, the umbrella over the whatever crazy thing I want to say, it sort of helps people believe it. Uh, but getting connected to the public school is important. And one of the things I was, this, your question popped up at when, when you're talking about the virtual, it's such a great vehicle for the activism because you can put so much more information. It's kind of like not having an overwhelming didactic next to your thing in the museum. I think art can go so far with activism. It's actually all of the activities around the art that creates the activism. The art has to exist as art. Uh, the activism is what you do around it. So it's, a, it's an interesting balance. The other thing about the virtual is that, I mean, for many of us, the goal is to, I know for my goal is to get other people to do their art and their action, and it's on demand. So if it's three in the morning and you're thinking about it, you can find other people who are doing it and be encouraged to, to bring your own voice to the, to the table. Great, thank you so much for elaborating on that. And it's just what I love about all of your work is the different spaces that it engages with. Um, I also love the engagement with kids and um, bringing art um, to schools and community spaces where families are gathering and it's kind of part of the natural trajectory of people's days because um, I think this idea of just kind of fitting it into the flow of people's lives um, helps make art accessible for everybody. So even people who aren't traditionally engaged in the arts or don't see themselves as artists or never learned how to appreciate art or understand art I just think it's a really just brilliant way to make it open to everybody um, in all of these different spaces and arenas. Um, one other thing um, that I was wondering if you could elaborate on is just kind of this balance between wanting to get the art out there, wanting to have it in the community and have it visible, but also um, balancing that against um, making sure that artists are fairly compensated and also that self-care piece. If the, the work is really emotionally draining um, or it, um, you know, it's, it's a lot, it's really labor intensive, like how do you balance all of the, the time and energy that goes into that and like unleashing the joy that's part of creativity against the fact that like as Helen and many other people mentioned um, it's really hard to make sure that artists are fairly compensated and recognized for all of this labor that goes into pieces and and the labor of exhibiting it I know Maggie was supposed to fly to Madison last year um, and was going to hang all of her work um, as part of a live exhibition we had and Abby was going to do this too and you both had like enormous pieces of work like this it was going to be really labor intensive even so you had already created it but then also getting it to these spaces and setting it up takes several several hours so um, that was a lot of things and a lot of comments, but really just kind of talking more about that tension um, of kind of compensation and protecting yourselves um, against making it visible and accessible. Who wants to go on that one? <laughs> oh, I'll start. I'll start. That's well, I would start with um, I definitely use humor to survive. <laughs> you know, like when you're uh, when I'm working, there's a research phase and it I can become a very, can kind of go down the rabbit hole of, of dark, how dark these issues are. And then um, I kind of look for, you know, you laugh or you cry, right? Or the preposterous level, the, the ridiculousness in the levels of pollution, you, there's some humor to be found there, but it's a dark humor. I, that's my survival, my coping skill. <laughs> and then of course I, my, I do, the handwork is important to me. And while it's also physically, demanding, it's uh, physically therapeutic. I like to get lost in my handwork. So um, the thing, I think being, that, that is a straight up artist question, that trade-off of, there are a lot of um, unpaid hours that just are part of the gig sometimes of, of, if you want it to be the way you want it to be, you might have to show up and make sure it's that way. And um, I think there are many institutions, again, that's a great thing about institutions pitching in and, and paying artists for, for their behind the scenes work uh, is really great. But yeah, that's a that's a part of it. Um, and I guess that's my 
it's a charity, I guess, when you do that work in service of, of the, the, the art. It's tithing, tithing time, tithing effort. Um, how much support, Abby, has have you had for your for the Tar Sands actual financial support? Um, we had a um, a five hundred dollar donation from one of the co sponsoring organizations, and everything else was in kind um, or time by participants. Uh, so we, in all ways in this project, kind of built the plane as we were flying it. Um, and to this day are still collecting. We found ways to sustain transportation and material costs as we went along. And to this day are still trying to retroactively um, kind of cover the costs that we, that folks invested in, in kind or in donation on the front end of the work. So. Um, wanted to point out that in the transparency of this work is we did just go at it and there were folks in the room who were already facing those challenges in their own work. Um, so I'll just add thinking ahead that we are looking, you look at partnership and we look at spaces where there is resource um, and, and to leverage those connections as best we can because um, it is the right thing to do. And as I said, it's, it's not just about the project that is produced at the end, but how we go about it together and that that, that is as important, if not more, as what is being created. And so it's, it's an ongoing uh, struggle, if I can use that word, but is certainly where our focus uh, will remain and questions we're still answering and, and, and balancing. So it's, it's tricky and I don't have a complete answer because I don't think it's going away anytime soon, even as we shift the scale or, or reimagine different ways for these projects to come together. I think, unfortunately, artists never get compensated enough. I think um, our education, our time. Um, I find that when I give lectures, yes, I do get paid for them, but that never covers the cost, it seems like, of the art being produced. And for my community, my gift, I'm, I'm not one to go out and protest and toe the line. My gift is to do my art and bring the attention to other people to help create allies so that we can um, have a bigger movement. And so I guess when I make art about certain political aspects, it is, it is just volunteer. It is coming from my own pocket. Yeah. Uh I'd like to just go back to something that was said. I think, I guess Maggie said it, that whole there, it's absolutely true. And Valerie, I bet you would agree with this, um, that the making of it itself has a healing aspect for ourselves. There's a flow and a meditation that happens there. And, um, but too often, because there's a certain level of pleasure in the making, if you're doing it right, the society as a whole thinks we should be uh, just happy to make it. <laughs> And oh, aren't you lucky you get to make art? And it's like, yeah, all right. Um, and yeah, it is. It's incredibly important. The process, I wouldn't be sane today if I did not have art in my life. But the actual work of getting it out into the world and making those, uh, making those contacts and connections and collaborate, that's activism. You know, that's, that's the work to get it out there to share it is three quarters of the activism. And uh, especially if we can figure out how to do it in a way where it has consequences that ripple out. Um, but uh, I, I do encourage people that come across projects like ours um, to, to think about the, what kind of things happen behind the scenes in order to make them possible. The mere fact that this conference is focused on the arts in a culture where the arts are at the bottom of the hierarchies um, is incredibly important and wonderful. And I thank Stephanie. Uh, as an artist doing these conferences, I never had the courage in all those years <laughs> to make the whole conference about the arts and creative uh, and so I thank you for doing it. And, just, and for W2. I wanted to follow up quick to offer something that I, I learned from Helen and simply that making art is an act of resistance. And since we are on a panel that is focused on climate justice, 
noting in this conversation all of the nods to capitalism, to patriarchy, to racism that are not only in this work, but again in the mechanics of the work and that that's something folks are grappling with on a lot of different levels. Um, so keep making art was what I've learned. Yeah, the world's not better if you don't. Yeah, in our, um, we had um, Charlotte Hill O'Neill as one of our panelists yesterday. Um, she also goes by Mama C and she's a poet and a healer and an inspirational artist in a lot of um, capacities and has roots in the Black Panther movement from the 60s and 70s. So one of the things that we've talked about is the long genealogy of art as a centerpiece of social movements. And I was wondering if you wanted to expand on that anymore, either kind of the long history of that or how you see it playing out in your work. Could you say the last part again, Stephanie, that was art as the center of social movements? Yeah, and I was saying either like that is a long genealogy that's been historically true or kind of in the, the current moment. Um, I will say in the indigenous circles, I think art has just been growing exponentially. It has been part of our movements. It has been, um, focusing on the movements. And I think that really came together with social media when the Keystone Pipeline happened. And I think then when all our nations came together to support that, we looked at each other and said, wow, we have this power and we can harness it. And there were a lot of artists that traveled to the camp at Keystone. So I think that um, we, we use our art to amplify um, the things we want to get across. And, and you can see it like on social media everywhere. I think um, it is changing uh, what political movements are about. I would add, um, I, my work has always been in the field of craft as art and artist craft. And, um, and as I, what I see happening a lot in art quilt and art embroidery and all of the craft-based media is a lot of these media seem very safe and comfortable to people. And it's a great stage to set um, where people are familiar with it and feel safe. And then you can sneak in all your messaging and all the serious things you wanna talk about. So um, it maybe has some surprises in it. And I'm seeing a lot of incredible women's work and men's work as well, but in the, in the art quilt world and uh, just, people have something to say and they, they manage to, you mean know, a lot like Helen's work, it, like there's beauty, but then there's something behind it and you're showing your values and then you're showing, well, what are you gonna do about it? If you care about this thing you choose to depict, what are you gonna do about it? So I, I think the crafts is a, an excellent place to, craft-based art is an excellent place to, to make sure you have not only craftsmanship and, um, but also meaning. And, yeah, I, I taught art on the university level for many years and uh, I found myself in a situation where first I had to teach the field um, so that my students graduated with the kind of knowledge they were expected to graduate with leaving an, an institution at the same time that I wanted that I taught resistance to what they were being taught and how uh, what were the problems with this particular uh, approach to uh, what is considered quote unquote good art who artists are that are who are artists who can be artists what is artists made, art made out of what are appropriate topics for art there's you know there's no there's just from the perspective that this is a, a conference of women and gender studies. There's not a single topic that's being addressed in women and gender studies that there's not artists out there making art about. So any, uh, any um, professors here who are watching that are dealing with any topic in women and gender studies, go find the artists that are working on those topics and share those in the work. Because the, the, one of the, um, <clears throat> our institutions don't show all the art. Uh, they're getting better, but they're not there yet. And uh, there's still a lot of prejudice in the world um, and uh, so we, we've had to figure out ways to do go beyond the traditional art world in order to share the art. I'm going to make this short, but I could go on about this for a while. <laughs> so, but uh, basically, um, uh, the, it's just uh, art for a long time was thought of as reflecting 
um, the world, but really art helps create the world. So we put in this work, those things that are, must be a part of what we see and must be a part of how we understand the world. And that's why it's so important for many, many, many artists to be at the table, especially the ones who seem to be making art that you can't figure out how it fits in the traditional art definition, because that's where some really interesting new work is being done that will help us learn from each other. And that's one of the things that we can do with the arts is learn from each other, come to the table with it and exchange information. And I'm gonna stop now. <laughs> well, I wanted to thank all of you so much. It was amazing to see your work and hear more about it. And then this conversation had so many valuable components of it. Um, I just wanted to highlight, you know, the discussion about compensation for the arts and the work that goes into it. Like that's why it's so important for there to be institutional support for the arts that translates into actual resources. So when there are government initiatives that talk for funding for the arts where there are community grants, um, those are really critically important. And across academia and elsewhere, we've seen a lot of the funding for the arts go way. And, um, you know, this really speaks to why that's a, a, a really deficit model of operating and supporting all of this amazing work. So um, again, I wanted to thank all four of you. I wanted to thank um, our audience for all of the great questions. Um, Olivia has put um, the, the link to the art exhibition in there one more time. And I wanted to thank Olivia for all of the hard work that went into putting that piece together and working with all of our artists. We have um, one more, um, we have another presentation coming up at 2.30. We have three more today. And our next session is Decolonizing Gender Studies. And it's gonna feature um, different projects across the UW system that take an intersectional and feminist approach to e equity and inclusivity. And um, we have representation from almost every single UW system campus, either a main or branch campus. And um, it's a great opportunity to kind of just learn more about um, the, the activist component of gender studies and how we collaborate with groups um, across our campuses and communities. So that is up next. Um, I also wanted to quickly thank the captioner who was on today from Riverside Captioning for um, doing all the hard work of um, captioning our dialogue and our back and forth, which was so fruitful. And um, thank you um, to Olivia and Ken for doing a lot of the behind the scenes support um, so that everything looked good on the user end. So um, I appreciate everybody's participation and attendance. And um, hopefully we'll see all of you later today for the other sessions that we have planned.